Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Lewis, founder of Real Health Innovations. We're a health creation company, and one of the key things we do is measure your physiology, that is your blood and even your urine, and interpret it very accurately from the perspective of chronic disease. I think that's really important because in today's society, a lot of people die suddenly, and nobody knows why. We say there's no excuse for that. There's always indicators. A classic example is the uh, narrator of Meet the Press, died suddenly. No one understood why. If you measure properly, you can find these things out, and they, there are always warning signs in advance. So what we have is we have something we call your CDT markers or your chronic disease temperature markers. So what we've done is taken standard and sometimes non-standard blood labs and looked at them from a chronic perspective. Think about this. If you have a blazing fire, that's your sick, and you need to go to the hospital or you're in bed, you don't feel well. But when things are just smoldering, you can get by with it. You don't have this huge fire. You don't have this huge problem. But smoldering issues can fester and eventually lead to something significant. Our CDT markers are all about determining if you have smoldering chronic disease in the background. And we can snuff those, the, the smoldering blaze out easily before it becomes a real health problem. So let's talk about what the CDT markers are all about. And the first marker is insulin. I think most people are aware of that, but insulin is a hormone and its real job is just to push sugar, to make fuel available. But did you know that insulin, when it's elevated into an abnormal range, can drive cancer and diabetes? And in fact, type 2 diabetics have much more cancer. It's not just because they're sicker, it's because their insulin levels are elevated and insulin simply pushes sugar, pushes fuel. It's like feeding your furnace very rapidly and cancer cells grow very fast. So it's a very nice one-two punch for cancer, having a lot of insulin pushing fuel and allowing those cells to grow very rapidly. So that's one of our CDT markers. So when we look at this, here's insulin. It's simply pushing glucose into cells and all cells need fuel, there's no doubt about it. But what's happening in, in modern society is we, because of the fuels, foods that we're using, high carbohydrates, high sugars, our cells are actually pushing back and say, you're pushing too much glucose into my blood. So what happens is then we have excess circulating glucose and when our brain detects all that excess glucose floating around, we produce more insulin. So it's sort of a vicious cycle. And that'll feed infection, that'll feed cancer, and it's a situation we call insulin resistance. So let's look at the consequences. Excess glucose, it's not of use to healthy cells, circulates in the bloodstream. Insulin is still responsible for managing the excess glucose. Some people call insulin the fat hormone because the excess insulin will take that excess glucose and send it to the liver to be converted for fat. Think about feast or famine from an evolutionary perspective. When we feasted on an animal or uh, agrarian uh, time frame when you had a lot of excess food, you put it to storage to store it for later use when food wasn't as bountiful. Today, we're reproducing that year-long cycle several times a day and our cells are paying the price for it. So the excess glucose with the help of insulin get pushed into fat. Or infection. A lot of people think that cancer can have a viral component. HPV, for example, is a virus that drives cancer. So that excess glucose with the help of insulin feeds the bacteria or feeds the tumor. So our second marker or set of markers in this case is glucose and A1C. And glucose is simply a measure of how much sugar is floating in our bloodstream. And we normally have no more than a teaspoon of glucose floating around. Then A1C is simply a marker of how much glucose was circulating in our blood dating back up to 90 days. It's a combination between 
our blood cells and the circulating glucose. So that tells you how aggressive glucose is if it can, it can react to form a new complex called A1C in our blood. So here's a normal red blood cell and here's one we call it caramelized with um, sugar because of the excess glucose we have circling, circulating around generally from too much carb. So how much glucose is present in your bloodstream? We can measure that very accurately by looking at A1C or looking at glucose. And in our chronic disease temperature, we're very particular. We're not waiting for you to become pre-diabetic or diabetic. We're looking at glucose and A1C levels that indicate you're heading in the wrong direction. We'll work with you on your carbs and other dietary and lifestyle things to help reduce those markers. So the next marker is triglycerides. So what this is now, if you're, if you're into betting, is the is the trifecta because we have the insulin, insulin goes up first, then glucose will go up in the blood and then the A1C will go up and then we'll see the triglycerides go, go up and triglycerides, there's problems with triglycerides, it can lead to fatty liver but really triglycerides is that step in the liver taking the glucose and converting it to fat and of all the markers we look at triglyceride levels really tell us about lifestyle and it's in completely in your control to, con to keep triglycerides at a decent level, 150 or below or even 100 or below. Keeps the liver healthy, keeps your bloodstream healthy, reduces inflammation as we reduce this marker and is a generally a good marker for health. So triglycerides, this measures the amount of excess glucose converted to fat and stored in the liver and the midsection. And so, for example, fatty liver is a serious disease that's often coupled with type 2 diabetes. It can be other exacerbating factors. But the liver is your chemical manufacturing plant. We need a healthy liver to be healthy. So we're trying to avoid the sugars to avoid the fatty liver. And triglycerides is our measure of your risk. So uric acid. Uric acid is tied to both cardiovascular disease and to kidney function. You may have heard of gout. So gout is excess uric acid to the point where the uric acid in our bloodstream can crystallize and form very sharp little needles. And it, they tend to collect in joints. So if you had joint pain, it may be tied back to uric acid. Why would you have excess uric acid? Let's explore uric acid a little bit. Certain sugars increase the production of uric acid and stimulate fat accu accumulation. So diet, uh, even if you're not taking in excess ca calories, you still could have elevated uric acid and it may lead, be a sign of progression to obesity and to type two, 2 diabetes. So uric acid is a metabolite from, uh, of you know, food consumption and the types of foods you eat, they're called purines that can increase the amount of uric acid your body produces. But also kidney function can be uh, a message we get from uric acid, a story that uric acid is telling us in that if your uric acid is building, it may simply be that your kidneys are not pulling the uric acid out of your system. So uric acid tells us a lot of different things about your health. It might tell us that you're in pain, it might tell us your kidneys are, are failing or not working well, or it may just tell us a lot about the richness, if you will, of your diet. So elevated levels of uric acid in the blood contributes to inflammation in the body. Patients with hypertension and elevated uric acid are three to five times more likely to experience coronary artery disease. Hypertension is presumed the silent killer, but the real silent killer is what causes our blood pressure to go up, and that is completely tied back to our kidney function, and uric acid is an extremely good marker of what's going on. It's one extremely good marker of what's going on in our kidneys. The next marker I'd like to talk to you about is white blood cells. Now, white blood cells 
produced in our bone marrow simply scouting cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells are scouts of our immune system looking for infection, looking for other invaders, looking for inflammation in, in our bloodstream. And if white blood cells go up out of normal ranges, it implies they found something and they're recruiting more friends to come help. The other side of the spectrum is your white blood cells can go down. In cancer, for example, people have abnormally low white blood cell count. Literally, the production of white blood cells is suppressed in cancer or they're highly consumed fighting the cancer. So let's look at white blood cells in your, in your blood vessels. White blood cells, main thing they do is fight infection. So we're <coughs> the thing in, in particular we're looking for is, is there an indication that you have infection going on, whether it's in your lungs or in your vessels. So when we look at white blood cell counts, we're looking at a very narrow range compared to the standard of care. The standard of care, your normal blood test, we're looking to see whether you're really sick, bedridden, or need to go to the hospital. The range looks something like this. When we look at white blood cell markers, we're looking at a very narrow range. And the key thing we're looking for is when is there an indication yet your white blood cells have gone to a level where there's a statistical increase in mortality. We're not worried about you being sick tomorrow. We're worried about you being healthy in five years. And that's how we're measuring white blood cells. So if you can look at white blood cell, this is an actual uh, electron micrograph where the white blood cell will actually glom on to the cancer cells. So there's ample evidence to support the link between inflammation and development and progression of cancer, but that's also true with cardiovascular disease, that's true with type 2 diabetes. So white blood cells are found in large numbers surrounding tumors. Whenever there's an insult, whenever there's something going awry in our body, our first line of defense, our very first line of defense are our white blood cells. And the quantity of the white blood cells correlate with tumor stage or the amount of tu uh, tumor burden, but it also corresponds with vascular inflammation, heart disease, things of that nature. Certain bacteria are able to form biofilms causing pain and inflammation. inflammation. One thing I want to point out is that white blood cells, we always hear about oxidative stress, but white blood cells form peroxide, which is oxidative. So a lot of people take, when they're sick, they take vitamin E or other antioxidants. Get your antioxidants from food, but don't stop the process of how your white blood cells work. They produce oxidation. That's how they kill invaders like bacteria, viruses, things of that nature. The next chronic disease temperature marker is red cell or red blood cell distribution width. It's an interesting concept, and a lot of doctors look at this as a measure of anemia, but really it's telling us about inflammation. Every red blood cell is a little disc, and each one's a little different size, so you get this distribution of width. And that distribution paints a very interesting picture about your health. Your kidney health, your vascular health, we'll go into this right now. So here's the red blood cell discs just throwing, flowing through a, a nice vessel, an artery, nice and red. But when a red blood cell goes through a capillary, it literally is all bent out of shape. It has to deform, and this actually is a generous size capillary. Sometimes these round disc-shaped things will, will squeeze into something that looks a lot more like a banana. So the red blood cell distribution measures the size of the red blood cells and how freely they can flow it's a tongue twister, particularly through the capillaries. Larger distribution widths often hint of inflamed or swollen vessels. Think about this capillary here, all occluded with plaque. That blood cell is going to literally get beaten up and have to squeeze down narrower than it normally would. And the distribution width at the end of the day will be a lot wider because of that. 
So the kidneys have a million little teeny micro filters. So the width of the blood cells is going to impact how the blood flows through these little micro filters. There's no more, there's no more of a larger capillary network than in the kidneys. So it has a profound, this red blood cell distribution width tells us a lot about how well the kidneys are filtering and can filter. The next thing I want to talk to you about in terms of a CDT, chronic disease temperature marker, is absolute neutrophils. And what is a neutrophil? We talked about white blood cells earlier. A neutrophil is one of five types of white blood cells. And a neutrophil is really the type of white blood cell that fights specifically bacteria and larger, um, larger infectious species that may lead to allergies and general inflammation. Well, type 2 diabetes is an inflammatory disease. Cancer is an inflammatory disease. Cardiovascular is an inflammatory disease. Joint pains are, is an inflammatory disease. So elevated neutral fills count suggest possible bacterial infection. It also tells us a lot about your total body inflammatory burden. So it's a very key marker as to are you progressing into a degenerative inflammatory disease. A little pain you may slough off is not a big deal. But chronic pain, that's an issue. Your neutrophil count is probably up. But the beautiful thing is we know what elevates neutrophils, infection. We know how to treat it, improve your overall terrain, your overall health. Maybe there might be some supplements or things of that nature that can help curb what's going on and restore you to better health. So the neutrophil is a very useful marker. The next one is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. What's that? That is an extraordinarily profound predictor of your cancer prognosis. Let me explain. So neutrophils elevate with inflammation. Neutrophils elevate with bacterial infection. Lymphocyte is another type of white blood cell. So neutrophils are white blood cell type. Lymphocytes are white blood cell type. Lymphocytes tend to be depressed in cancer. Lymphocytes tend to be depressed with viral infections. So what we have is this ratio, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which takes two very well-known mechanisms of cancer and other inflammatory disease and basically magnifies it by taking the, uh, the ratio. So it's an extreme, extremely sensitive marker. We look, at, we look at this. So as neutrophil goes up in the presence of bacterial infection, lymphocytes go down in the presence of virus and cancer. So the ratio is this very large number. And we look at the gradation of this, and essentially we can tell the person has the likelihood if they get cancer, the worst prognosis in any group, and the best prognosis just by looking at this marker. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is another CDT, chronic disease temperature marker. A lot of people are looking at vitamin D. We're looking at it very differently because the standard RDA or the accepted levels for vitamin D is really tied to bone health. So the number is 30, 30 nanograms per milliliter. We believe you need to be at 55 nanograms per milliliter or above. Why? Because vitamin D is not just a vitamin. And what vitamin, does for, vitamin D does for bone health, it helps mobilize calcium and makes the calcium you eat available to your body. And calcium is involved in every heartbeat. It's also involved in strengthening bones. So it's an extremely important mineral. And you can't have one without the other. You need the vitamin D. So at 30 nanograms per milliliter, there's enough vitamin D to mobilize calcium. But vitamin D, we now realize, it was named 100 years ago or more, is really a hormone derived from cholesterol. And hormones regulate metabolism. The thyroid hormone, the adrenal hormones, vitamin D is part of that hormonal cascade that regulates our entire body's physiology. So what does vitamin D do? 
it has a profound effect on the regulation of cell division. And what is cancer? Aberrant cell division. So what research has shown is that vitamin D levels well above what's necessary for bone health, which is 30, but rather above 55, people at 55 or above, 55 to 100, have much less cancer than people just in the uh, sufficient range, 30 to 55. So vitamin D is extraordinarily important to health. So vitamin D is a hormone that regulates cellular processes. When needed, an activated form of vitamin D is produced in the liver. This is called calcitriol or activated vitamin D. So some people will say, yes, we're taking our vitamin D, but the levels are low. Why? You're activating it. So I look at vitamin D as the militia in the barracks, whereas the activated form is now the militia deployed working for you. So if your vitamin D status is lower than you expect, there's something else going on that we need to investigate. Active, activated vitamin D helps downregulate inflammation. I call activated vitamin D God's antibiotic. Activated vitamin D has antibiotic properties that help control infection. And cancer is a disease of uncontrollable cell growth. Vitamin D is involved in ensuring normal cell growth. So vitamin D is an extraordinarily important. It's difficult to get from foods. Do get sensible sunlight. And supplementation is normally required to get to the kind of status, particularly if you don't live in Florida uh, or Ecuador. So it's really required as a supplement. The next marker is C-reactive protein in our chronic disease temperature. And this is an extraordinarily important marker. We have a Framingham risk scale, but the best risk scales include traditional markers, but also include C-reactive protein. It's an extraordinarily well-known, well-understood marker. And really what it's doing is measuring inflammation right in the tissue of our vessel walls. So the red blood cell distribution width, which I talked about a little bit earlier, is looking at how roughened up or beaten up red blood cells get as they course through our vessels. So that's looking at the blood cells themselves. C-reactive protein actually looks at the tissue itself inside the vessels. So it's extraordinarily important as a marker. So C-reactive protein is produced in the liver in response to inflammation. So if I bang my toe, tomorrow my C-reactive protein will go up. I have inflammation. However, if I didn't bang my toe and my C-reactive protein's up a little bit, maybe I have some sort of chronic thing going on that's creating some inflammation. And I take it in another week or another month, and it's still up. I have a chronic inflammatory process going on in my vessels. That's what we're looking for, and that's the value of C-reactive protein. So elevated C-reactive protein can signal many different conditions. It's inflammation. That's one of the criticisms of running C-reactive protein. It's nonspecific. But it's up in all these different conditions from infection, cardiovascular disease, cancer, arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease. Wouldn't you want to know your inflammatory status? If someone can say how inflamed you are, wouldn't that be a value to you? It's a value to us, and we use it to measure how our program is working to lower your inflammatory burden. Extraordinarily important, measuring low level. Once again, that concept of you're not ablaze, you're smoldering. Now is the time to put out the fire. The best measure of the smoke coming off that fire is C-reactive protein. High C-reactive protein is even tied to progression to or risk for Alzheimer's disease. Extraordinarily important. So the next marker we're going to look at is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. Complicated word, very simple concept. When you cut yourself, there are proteins in our circulatory system that come to the rescue and knit up that that breakage and heal and heal. Fibrinogen is that marker. So really fibrinogen is in essence a measure of clotting, the clotting ability within your blood. And there's a range that's optimal for clotting. 
If I see too little fibrinogen, it means that I'm probably recruiting it somewhere in my body and I'm clotting all over the place like crazy. Not a good sign. And on the other end of the spectrum, if fibrinogen is too high, that means the likelihood I'm going to clot, and clotting, of course, is tied to stroke and other cardiovascular diseases, is not a good sign either. So we want you to be in an optimal range. So we're really interested in, you know, this cholesterol is used all too often as the only marker for cardiovascular disease. Clotting is an extraordinarily impactful parameter to understand when it comes to your risk. And this is completely modulatable. When we have people with fibrinogen is too high or too low, dietary adjustments, suppl supplementation adjustments, little exercise, and we see that fibrinogen come down to good levels. So here we see in a little cross section here in the brain, the blood cells collecting. There's clotting going on there. Never a good thing. Ischemia or stroke, we lose blood flow through that entire network. So fibrinogen is produced in the liver and is essential for stopping blood loss from damaged tissue through blood clot formation. High fibrinogen levels have been associated with heart attack and stroke. So, and of course we need it. So there'd be no drug to lower fibrinogen because you need fibrinogen, your body finds its right level. We want to make you healthy, your fibrinogen will come into a no-stroke zone on its own. So the next thing tied to fibrinogen is a very simple old-fashioned test. It's called your erythrocyte blood cell sedimentation rate. And all we're doing is looking at how fast your blood settles. Healthy blood does not settle because it holds itself up. Healthy blood does not clot. Blood that settles means the cells don't mind being next to each other. That means they don't mind clotting. Not a good thing. So we are electric beings. Every heartbeat is an electrical impulse. Okay, but we're not plugged in to a socket. We have our, every battery, every cell in our body is a little battery. So healthy cells repel each other like magnets, like pole, the North Pole of the magnet repelling each other. So the blood cells are designed to stay up and flow through our vessels, not collect, aggregate, and clot. The ESR, as I'll call it, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, tests how quickly red blood cells settle when allowed to sit in a tube. Healthy blood does not settle. How healthy is yours? So here's healthy blood. Here's blood that doesn't mind being next to each other. The next CDT marker is called homocysteine. Now homocysteine is truly a measure of cardiovascular disease health. And what's interesting is everybody's worried about Alzheimer's. One of the best markers for Alzheimer's, your future risk for it, is homocysteine levels and particularly the trend in homocysteine. So every five upticks in homocysteine, there's a 40% inferred increased risk in Alzheimer's and vascular disease. So it's something we watch very carefully, homocysteine. So homocysteine is tied to all kinds of different diseases, from pregnancy complications, dementia, heart disease, bone health, Elevated levels of homocysteine can pose a significant health risk. One of the main things, and it's really a, a measure also of kidney function, which is tied to our blood circulatory system. So it's really critically important. And how we modulate, we measure homocysteine with a simple blood test, and how we mod modulate homocysteine is really through lifestyle. It's reducing the inflammatory burden that you're bringing on through lifestyle and through diet. Ferritin, another CDT marker, it's really, ferritin is your iron storage system. So we take in iron, obviously there's iron coursing through our cells, all our blood cells, the red in the blood cell is from iron, but it's such an important nutrient, such an important mineral, we need to have a storage facility for that. We have a storage facility for fat, 
We have, uh, and um, for energy rather, and that's our fat, we have a storage facility for minerals called our bones, but we also have a special storage facility for iron called ferritin. So ferritin is a pro protein that stores excess iron for use as needed in times of deficiency. And similar way your fat stores, uh, your fat stores excess calories. So clinically elevated ferritin has been linked to inflammatory response. In fact, women shed iron every month. Men don't shed iron. And one of the potential reasons why women outlive men, outlive men is because of the excess iron burden that we're carrying. We're collecting and collecting iron from birth to death. And in fact, there's been a lot of studies that show that men who give blood have less diabetes, have less cancer, have less cardiovascular disease. So it pays to shed a little iron because we have very iron-rich, protein-rich, iron-rich diets. Next thing I'm going to talk about is called GFR for short. It's easier for me to say GFR than glomerular filtration rate, but really it's a measure of how well your kidneys are filtering out toxins. Now, the kidneys are we're a very efficient system. Not everything that's a, that's a waste product in our bloodstream is just discarded. Some of it's recycled. The kidneys are differentiating between the good and the bad, throwing away the bad, and recirculating good. Highly sophisticated organ. So kidneys are the filter of our body. Actually, each kidney houses about a million filtering units called nephrons. Kidneys remove waste products from the blood, including toxins, proteins, medications, which really are toxins. They have benefit, but they also have side effects. Toxicity is one of those side effects. The filtering process is measured by what we call GFR. So a low GFR tells us the kidneys are not able to filter as well as they should. Reduced kidney function can lead to kidney failure and dialysis is the process of artificially filtering the kidneys. So that's a summary of the major markers that we use as part of what we call the chronic disease temperature. The nice thing about the chronic disease temperature for you as a participant or even as a clinician is you don't have to know all the values associated with every one of these uh, contributors, these biomarkers that contribute to our assessment of your health because we take them all and aggregate them into a single number, your chronic disease temperature. Yes, we want your C-reactive protein, your inflammatory marker to go down. Yes, we want your kidney filtration rate to go up. But more importantly, we want the constellation of these markers, which individually each marker is important, but as a constellation, all the markers tell us a much more important story. As long as your chronic disease temperature is coming down, you're in a health creation process, and you should head in that, continue to head in that direction. Thank you very much.